Hi, this is Allison Sheridan of the NoSillaCast podcast, hosted at podfeed.com, a technology geek podcast with an ever so slight Apple bias. Today is Sunday, November 24th, 2024, and this is show number 1020. Now, you know I love me a good pivot table, right? I found a nifty website from the U.S. Department of Energy that includes this treasure trove of data on electric vehicles and chargers. Of course, I had to tell Bodie Grimm of the Kilowatt Podcast about it, and then I showed him how I was able to take some downloads of data from this website, make a pivot table to see the progress in level three chargers over the past year, like how many have we gained by company. He thought this was cool, and he asked me to come on his show to talk about the data set and how pivot tables helped me analyze this treasure trove of data. We had a blast, because how could you not? When you're talking to Bodhi and getting to nerd out on data, that's the best. Anyway, you can find the episode at the link in the show notes, or subscribe to the Kilowatt Podcast in your podcatcher of choice, and look for the episode entitled EV Data Made Fun with Allison Sheridan. I put a link in the show notes to the pivot table spreadsheet I talked about during our conversation with Bodhi. I actually figured out how to get OneDrive to let me share a file. It's harder than I thought it should be. Anyway, there's two tabs with the raw data dump from the Department of Energy about level three chargers for October 2023 and October 2024. And then I have two pivot tables, uh, one for each of the raw data sets. The front page you see compares the two pivot tables to show the growth by each company in the number of chargers. If you'd like to download your own data set, the Alternative Fuels Data Center site from the US Department of Energy is on a link in the show notes. In Programming by Stealth 172, Bart Bouchatz explained what Git submodules are and the kinds of problems they solve. It was kind of a theoretical lesson. But in this week's show, in this practical lesson, he walks us through three scenarios where we actually get to get our fingers dirty and type in Git commands to learn how the process actually works. We get to pretend we're in a small web app business where company branding is important. In the first scenario, we're a new developer joining an app team, and we have a repo that already includes the branding submodule. In the second scenario, we're a seasoned developer on the team creating a new app, and we need to import the branding submodule. Finally, in the third scenario, we're one of the brand designers, and we want to update the branding. In that third scenario, we learn two different ways to incorporate the branding changes into the web apps for scenarios one and two. I got to tell you, I'm always happy when I get to play along in the terminal, so this lesson was great fun. Of course, you can find Bart's fabulous tutorial show notes over at pbs.bartofrisser.net, and you can subscribe to Programming by Stealth for looking at, by looking for it in your podcatcher of choice. On last week's NoSillaCast, I told you about how Paul Nealon made a very generous donation to support the show using PayPal. I also read you his letter in which he explained that he would have done it sooner, but he had trouble getting over the hump of creating a PayPal account. He also said, if I just had a PayPal button, that would have made it easier for him. This had literally never occurred to me before he suggested it. I did a bit of hunting around, and I found that the service Stripe could give me a way to take donations without the user having to open any kind of an account. Now, here's a fun fact. Stripe is an Irish-American multinational company dual headquartered in Dublin and California. So it's completely in alignment with Bart and me. I try to keep the dirty money bits away from the podcast, but I think it's an interesting point in time to talk about how these systems work from my end and then get into the technical aspects of how I made this change. PayPal charges me a 2.99% payment processing fee. So if you donate 25 bucks, they take 75 cents, leaving me with 24.25. Stripe also charges a fee, and it's a smidge less at 2.9%, but they also charge a $0.30 processing fee on top of that. So the same $25 donated using Stripe would only leave me with $23.98 versus the $24.25 through PayPal. As the donation amount gets bigger, that tiny difference in the fee percentage outweighs the the $0.30 fixed fee, but overall, you know what, they're close enough for me to consider them equivalent. The main thing from my perspective is that if I make it easier for you, maybe you're more likely to push that button and that's going to beat the 30 cents every time. Well, the first step was to to create a Stripe account and that was unsettling since I'll be doing financial transactions on my behalf and depositing money into my accounts 
And I presume reporting my income somewhere to government agencies, they need to know pretty much every bit of personally identifiable information about me. So I had to give them my address, my phone number, my bank account number, and social security number. Was, yikes, you know, I, I did all of this with PayPal and Patreon, of course, but I haven't done it recently. I wasn't comfortable with having my phone number and home address in the system because the way they originally described it, my phone number and address would appear on invoices that you would be sent after you donated. I love you all, but you know, that's just a smidge more exposure than I was interested in. Luckily, I did some online sleuthing about it and I found a toggle where I could turn it off and it turned out to be off by default. So that was nice. Now, Stripe is designed for people selling things, so there's a lot of features I don't need. There wasn't any upsell, though, and I was able to create a fairly simple form fairly quickly with the relevant information. I was able to add my Podfeet logo to the form, for example. Strangely, it, it put a cute little Podfeet in the upper left and a giant pair of Podfeet in the middle as well. Not quite sure how to control that. They also had some branding options to match my color palette, but it seemed a bit extreme. The defaults, I think, will be more familiar to people, which gives a feeling of confidence. You have absolutely seen a Stripe screen before, and you'll recognize it'll, it'll feel like, oh yeah, this is how you pay for these things. It was suggested that I put in a default dollar amount, so I chose 20 bucks. But you can change that. It's not as obvious as I would have liked that you can change it. It's a light gray pill button that says, change amount and then the $20 will become ed editable. Hey, maybe I should have made it $1,000 so you'd be motivated to find the button. Oh, well, I did poke around a bit. To, I wanted to see, could you change to a currency of your choosing, but I didn't find a way to do that. I did find something that says it would do it, but it didn't seem to work. Right below that suggested amount, they give me a description field. This way you can see your donation will pay for expenses such as servers, software, and other hardware used to create the podcast. Now, the best part is that prominently displayed at the top is a black button with Apple Pay in white. You can't miss it. And while that was my main goal, Stripe also allows a whole slew of other options. You'll be able to use any credit card, not just Apple Pay, and you can use the Cash App, Amazon Pay, something called Klarna, and another one called Link. Now, I've noticed that while the Apple Pay logo is prominently displayed on top all, the, all of the time, the other services kind of cycle through the number two spot right next to it. Now, I was talking to Pat Dingler about Stripe, and she's been using it for ages, and she asked why I didn't have Google Play showing. I went back to where I'd removed, uh, I'd uh, been messing around with Link and some of the other options, and sure enough, I was able to put in Google Pay. Oddly, Google Pay doesn't show up on the payment page and I haven't been able to figure out why. There's another strangeness. If you're not using Safari, but instead you use a Chromium browser like Microsoft Edge, Arc, or even Google Chrome, you will not see Apple Pay. I looked up why, and it had something to do with Apple's security requirements, but I couldn't get anything less vague than that. Now, I haven't dug into it too much, but there's also an option to set up subscriptions in Stripe. That might be interesting. What if you wanted to do regular monthly donations, but you didn't want to have a Patreon account? I'm not sure how that works, though. I think you might have to assign a price, or I might have to assign a price, and that's not the way I like to do things. I like, I like you guys to get to pick the number you want to donate, but it's a thought for the future. Now, once I had the form set up and gave away my firstborn child to Stripe, sorry, Lindsay, the service gave me a long gobbledygook URL. It starts with buy.stripe.com and then has all the glop after that. But you know, I'm not going to make you remember that address. Everything's good. It's got to start with podfeed.com, right? I needed to come up with a memorable name to send you to. I could have used podfeed.com slash Stripe, but then you'd have to remember what service I chose. Also, if I ever changed away from Stripe, then, then that would stop working and you'd have to learn a new URL. Just like how podfeed.com slash chat takes you to Discord, in case we ever move how we chat and you won't have to learn a new thing, this fancy new link to Stripe is at podfeed.com slash donate. I know, I know, Patreon's at podfeed.com slash Patreon and PayPal's at podfeed.com slash PayPal, but I'm trying to future-proof these things. So the new URL is podfeed.com slash donate. In order to create these redirects, so you don't have to remember hard URLs, I have to do some interesting work. 
My server is hosted by DigitalOcean, and if I log into their web service, I get a button to open console, and that logs me into my server at the command line with root privileges. I know this is possible using GUI tools like Core Shell, available in Setapp, but it seems kind of fragile to me. I keep having to ask Bart or Bill to help me get it working again. They've both helped me more than once, and it just seems to be broken every time I go in to use it. The console button in DigitalOcean site is 100% reliable, which is why I choose that method instead. Now that I'm logged into my server with root privileges, I have to remember the structure of how my web server is set up. As you'll probably remember, awesome NoSilicastWay Bill helped me do major surgery on my server, including moving it from the web server Apache to something called Nginx. The good news is I took copious notes as Bill told me what to do. I keep those notes and keep it by reinvented software. I'm really glad I have these notes because he created a structure that has more than one directory that looks like it's my web server. There are sites-available and sites-enabled. In my copious notes, I quoted Bill. He said, only make changes to the file in the sites-available directory. The sim-linked file in sites-enabled will automatically change. Okay, whatever that means, I made sure I recorded also in my notes, all of this is in slash etc slash nginx slash sites-available. All right, we've logged into the console. We know how to change directory to sites-available. And I also recorded that the file to be edited to add these redirects is called podfeet.com, I'm sorry, podfeet.conf. So it's a configuration file. I didn't write this in my notes, but I remember every time Bill and I messed with this file, Bill made me make a copy of it first with the current date, just in case we borked it up. This podfeed.com file has a lot of stuff in it, but the section we're interested in is the redirects. I usually duplicate and then edit one of the existing redirects because it's a pretty arcane little command. The, the line says location equals, then forward slash and the word I want you to use in the URL. So I put slash donate. Next, we have to tell the web that this is a redirect, and you do that with the term return 302. And then you follow that by where you want it to redirect to, in our case, the Stripe URL with all the glop in it. I put in the show notes the entire thing, but I'm not going to read it to you because it's long and annoying. Once the file is safely, fa uh, sorry, safely saved, I need to tell the web server Nginx to reload so it sees the new config file. That's done with a system management command called systemctl. The command is systemctl reload nginx. At this point, I was able to type in podfeet.com slash donate and verify that it redirects to our fancy new Stripe page offering Apple Pay and other methods. On podfeet.com, one of the red buttons says support the show. That button takes you farther down the homepage to a row of linked images for the different ways you can help out. We've got Patreon, PayPal, a link to all my referral links, and finally, a suggestion to support the show by recording a review. I wanted to add an icon that would take you to our fancy new donate page over on Stripe. Now, I use a theme called Site Origin North, which gives me kind of a little building block method to create the custom homepage you see. I had four icons for supporting the show, so I had to squeeze in another one for the Stripe link, but I didn't want to use Stripe's logo. Instead, I used the Noun Project, which is the worst name on earth for an awesome service to find icons. I pay for this service because it's so great, but it has the most unmemorable name. I sit there for a long time going, oh my gosh, what is it called? I don't remember. Anyway, I finally found the Noun Project, and I found an icon that looks like a MasterCard with a little magnetic stripe, and then the icon has a dollar bill symbol on it. In the Noun Project, you can also change the color before you download the icon, so I used the color picker to make it the same flashy red as my buttons. I uploaded my fancy new icon and resized it to mostly match the size of the other ones. That's always been a struggle. They're kind of lumpy looking. I, don't know, I try to align them, but it doesn't really work. Anyway, we now have a link to Stripe that says Donate with Credit Card. While I was there messing around with the homepage, I realized that the row of icons above the ways to support the show was for tutorials. And I don't really do that many tutorials per se anymore. I mean, I guess I just did a tutorial for you about this whole signature thing, but it's just not a thing I do constantly. So I deleted that entire row, so the page is actually a lot shorter. Then I noticed I still had a Twitter icon as a way to be in the conversation, so I deleted that for obvious reasons. I noticed that there's kind of a big gap in the rows, 
And I do need to fix that, and I think I know how, but it's kind of arcane in the Site Origin uh, North theme builder, so I'm going to save that for another day. You know, this could have been a one-liner when I panhandle for donations in the middle of the show, but I thought it might be fun to pull back the curtain on how all of this works in the background. I participate in an Apple user group through email where I often answer questions from those requesting help. And I can't resist the urge to share my expertise if it's going to help somebody else. Recently, a woman posted that someone had emailed her a document. She wanted to open it, sign it, and send it back all without printing it out. She understood this could be done, but she didn't have any idea how to do it. This was something I could explain. Now, you may receive a PDF and want to do the same thing, but I'm going to start kind of one step backwards. She had received an editable text document, not a PDF. So I'll explain how to quickly create a PDF that you can sign. I'm going to go through in detail how to do this on a Mac and on an iPhone. Because I'm going to give you the details with screenshots and the show notes, it might get easy to get lost in all the detail I'm going to give you. So here at the beginning, I'm going to give you the outline, then I'll give you all the detail, and then I'm going to give you the outline again at the end so it sticks in your head. By the way, she also didn't want to save any files, which is a little bit odd in my opinion, but she didn't want to save anything, so there's some steps I may go through where I kind of skip over ever saving the file. All right, let's talk the outline of what we're going to do. We're going to open the text document. We're going to, and I'm going to put this in air quotes, print the document to PDF. We're going to open the PDF in either preview on the Mac or files on iOS. We're going to use markup tools to create a signature. We're going to add that signature, and then we're going to send the document back. Okay, that's not too bad, right? That's a concise set of steps, but I'm going to make sure there's so much detail you can't remember those steps. I'll tell you them again at the end. All right, let's start with opening the text document. The woman I was helping had received a Microsoft Word document, and I explained to her that she could open it with Apple's free Pages app because she didn't have Microsoft Word. If you don't already have Pages installed, it's a quick download from the App Store. A huge advantage is that Pages runs on iOS too, so you can follow along with these steps on the Mac, iPad, or iPhone. There is one caution about opening Word files with Pages. You may run into some formatting problems caused by the translation between the apps or maybe missing fonts. If it's terrible, I'd suggest sending, asking the sender to just give you a PDF instead. In fact, if somebody sent me an editable document to sign, I'd be kind of tempted to change and make to make the terms more favorable to me before I did any signing. That'll teach him. All right, let's assume for this exercise that you can open the document in pages without issue. The process to create, sign, and send a PDF is slightly different between the Mac and iOS, And so rather than flipping back and forth between two operating systems, I'm going to walk first through the solution on the Mac, and then I'll explain it again on iOS, because it is different. Once we have the document open in Pages on the Mac, we need to get it into Preview to add the signature. It's very simple to create a PDF on the Mac, because it's built into the print function. Within Pages, choose File, Print, or Command-P. But do not hit the Print button at the bottom right, because that's going to actually print the document. Instead, select the down chevron next to PDF. If you want to save it as a PDF, you can, but our goal is to never save a copy. Instead, you can simply choose Open in Preview. I actually found this when I was looking this up for this woman, because I didn't realize you could go directly to Preview at this point. Now for the fun part. In Preview, select the pen in a circle, and that'll show you the Markup Toolbar. In the Markup Toolbar, you're going to find a Signature Tool. It looks like a line with a scribbly signature above it. The signature icon will reveal an option to create a signature using one of three options. You can scribble your signature using your trackpad, so you know that it looks like a three-year-old signed it. Or you can use the camera on your computer, and you use that to take a photo of your signature you make on a piece of paper, and you hold that signature up to the camera so you can get a really nice one. Thirdly, you can scribble your signature on your iPhone screen, which I'm pretty sure will also look like a three-year-old signed it. But maybe you want that three-year-old signature and you have a mouse instead of a trackpad, so that would be the only way you could get the three-year-old signature. I personally prefer creating a nice-looking signature by signing on a piece of paper with a real pen and then holding that up to the camera. Note that you can also use the description down uh, drop-down to sign a stock name for this signature or to create a custom name. I never bothered to do that because I can see visually which signature is which. 
Once your signature is stored in preview, you never have to do this step again. Simply tap on the signature you made from the dropdown and it'll plop into the document you have open in preview. Because we opened the pages document directly into preview, it's not actually a proper PDF yet, so you should see an error saying, this document has changed and it has to be saved. We're just gonna ignore that because we're gonna be able to take, it, uh, take care of that later. At this point, you can drag the signature from where it got plopped into the middle of the document, drag it up onto the line where you want to sign, and you can resize it with the little corner elements. Now, the original request was to do this entire process without ever saving the PDF. So, from preview, we can select the share row, the share arrow, get it, share row? We can select the share row and then select mail. This will launch mail.app and attach a PDF of our signed document. Even though we never saved it as a PDF, remember it was yelling at us and you got to save this first, we never did that. That PDF simply comes into existence when we select send to mail. Personally, I would recommend saving a copy of any document you sign, you know, for your own protection in case of some sort of dispute, but I still thought it was nifty we can do all of this without ever saving a document. You'll have to quit without saving after that. Now keep in mind, preview stores your signature. I said you only need to do that step once. From now on, anytime you need to sign something, you'll have that signature available from the markup toolbar. All right, let's switch gears and go through the process on iOS because like I said, it is different. If you already created your signature on the Mac, you can just use it on iOS because it's gonna show up. But let's go through the process assuming you're starting from scratch on iOS. I'm thinking about the time that Lindsay, the daughter, and her husband were with us on vacation and they only had their iPhones with them. They got a document from the realtor that had to be signed right away because they were closing on their first house. We used this technique to help them sign the document and send it back just from an iPhone. Let's assume that you, like Lindsay, received a text document in email. Like with the Mac, you can install pages on the iPhone. In mail.app, if you tap on the download button next to the document, you could choose to save it to files, but let's see if we can do it without ever saving that file. Instead of tapping on the enclosed document in mail, press and hold on the document. You'll get a little preview of the document with options to open in quick look, save to files, share, or copy. But we don't want any of those. Simply tap the preview of the document again, and it'll close those options, but keep that little preview of the document up. We'll still see the preview of the document, but now we can see an option at the bottom that says open in pages. Once we have it open in pages, we're gonna do the same thing we did on the Mac. We're gonna go into the print menu so we can quote unquote print a PDF. With the document open in pages, use the share to select print. Now you're gonna see a print dialog box with no clues that you can save a PDF from here. The hidden secret is to pinch out on the screen. All of that print dialogue information will simply disappear and you'll be looking at a nearly identical preview. But this is no longer a pages document, now it's a PDF. If you want to prove it to yourself, tap on the chevron at the top next to the name of the file and you'll see it says it's a PDF. Let's tap away to close that. Now tap the share row from this PDF and choose mail. The PDF will be attached to a new email. Double tap on the PDF inside mail and you'll see a pop-up menu. All it says is cut, copy, paste, and writing tools. We don't want any of those. To the right of that is a chevron. Keep tapping the chevron to slide in new menu options, and eventually you're going to see markup. In the markup tools, you'll see the pen, pencil, and eraser tools across the bottom, but on the far right, I want you to tap the plus button. Within this list of tools, we can select add signature. If you've previously created a signature on your Mac or iOS device, as I mentioned, it'll be available to you right here. You'll also see the option to add or remove signatures. From this menu, you'll see any signatures you created previously with red buttons to remove them, but you also get a plus button to add a new one. Unlike the nice option on the Mac where you could scan a signature you wrote with a pen or on paper, on iOS, you only have the option to sign like a three-year-old. I know a lot of people are comfortable with a signature that's maybe just a squiggle, but I like mine to look like my name. Do your best and notice there's a clear button to let you start over if it's not representative of your real signature, then tap done. If you're using an iPad with pencil, you'll probably do an admirable job on this step. 
Now, as soon as you finish creating the signature, it's going to, again, plop into the middle of the PDF just like it did on the Mac. You can drag and resize your signature, but on iOS, there's also a little line you can tap on to allow you to change the color and line thickness of your signature. I made my signature purple and significantly thicker. Still looks like a three-year-old signed it, but at least it's pretty now. The stored signature is still thin and black, so you'll have to prettify it every time you insert it into a document. Tap done, and your PDF with your lovely or childish signature appears on the document in mail, and we never saved a document. The bottom line is that it's really easy to add your signature to a document you've received and send it right back. Now, I promised I'd review the steps at the end. You can come back and review the details, but remember, this process is simple. You receive a document, you print it to PDF, use the built-in Apple markup tools to add a signature, and you can create a signature once and use it across your Mac and iOS devices. I bet you're wondering what I'm going to talk about during my quick support the show segment, aren't you? Well, I got a wild and crazy idea. How about you go to podfeet.com slash donate and try out my fancy new Apple Pay method of donating money to support the show. Or if you're not an Apple Pay person, you could use a normal credit card. You know, it'd be swell if, you know, some people tested it out for me for, yeah, for research purposes, of course. Well, it's that time of the week again. It's time for Security Bits with Bart Boosh Shots. And I just noticed something. I think my voice sounds normal. I think it might be back finally. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yay, better late than never. Good, good, good. Is it a month and a half of gravel voice? Uh, well, hey, you know, it's winter, so these things happen. I guess so. Um, you normally ask me how was the week of security news and stuff. Uh, let's just say that we have two deep dives because otherwise these show notes had a very, very big scroll bar oh. instead of a very, very small scroll bar. So it's a good week. It's a good week cybersecurity-wise, and I, I found us some interesting conversations to have anyway. Um, you're going to have to give me a little bit of leeway from our usual definition, but I promise I'll bring it right back around. Um, and I think it's interesting. I hope it's interesting. Anyway, we shall find out. Uh, we have two little follow-ups to stuff we've talked about before. Uh, we talked recently enough about a big Chinese state-sponsored hack of American telcos. This was an example of why a backdoor for the good guys isn't actually a thing because it's a backdoor. This was backdoor access meant for American law enforcement, and the Chinese government got into it and therefore were able to get basically spy on senior American officials. Who agreed to have a backdoor? What company here? Or Oh, the, well, T-Mobile has now confirmed that they were hacked. All of the American cell phone carriers allow law enforcement to do intercepts, right? We've had phone tapping forever. Basically, they hacked the phone tapping system. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yay. I thought that happened yeah. a while ago, didn't uh, it? Correct, but then the list of affected telcos did not include T-Mobile, and now T-Mobile have put their hands up and went, oh yeah, we had a wee look at our logs, erm, oh, it was us two. Okay, yay. Yeah. Uh, we, all, we know that there is a cat and mouse game between the vendors of these grey hat security devices, like Grey Key, which are designed to unlock smartphones, um, not just iPhones, but they do include iPhones, and we very rarely know where the cat and the mouse are in the race because they're a very secretive company and they don't like it to be known what they do and don't have the current capability of doing. So there was a rare leak of a an Excel sheet uh, showing the current feature set as a matrix against the different models of phone and the different OSs and stuff. Basically, it, none of it is shocking to me, but the old adage of it's worth upgrading holds true. If you are on the very latest physical iPhone with the very latest version of iOS, you are more protected than if you are on older iOSs or older iPhones because Apple keep adding hardware and software hardening and it works. It, it helps. So if you are trying to make an excuse of why you can't upgrade to iOS 18, iOS 18 goes back to the iPhone XR. 
I have I have one in my hands right. to prove it. I mean, I'm looking at uh, Apple's oh, wow. uh, configuration or their compatibility listing for iOS 18. But I got this from my grandson, and uh, when I upgraded him, and uh, it's a great little phone, and it's it's on iOS 18. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. Now, obviously, the newer hardware gets extra features too because you have better security chips and stuff. So if you're the kind of person who is a CEO or is someone of value, it is actually fiscally, you now have a reason to go to your IT department and say, it is worth the financial interest of this company to give me a brand new iPhone every year because it will help protect our corporate secrets Hmm. or if you're a diplomat or whatever. The other thing is it remains true that on average, iPhones remain more secure than Androids. And that's coming, that's not opinion, there are that's exceptions. coming from this article that you're quoting? Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh. Yeah. So, you know, and there are, averages have outliers. So I'm not saying if you get the very latest, very best uh, direct from Google Pixel, that you're not approximately as good as an iPhone. But on average, most Android phones are not the very best, latest Pixel straight from Google, there's something else. It's probably which good means to they include, tend to have more holes. It's probably good to consider, think about tablets in that too. Google just discontinued their Pixel tablet. So it's, I assume that uh, that would also go for Samsung though. They're pretty good about uh, doing the high-end stuff and keeping their, their devices up to date compared to, you know, they, the $100 one you can get. They are, but my understanding of market share numbers is that there is an iPhone, there is an iPad market and a few other tablets. Mm-hmm. Um, no, none of them seem to have taken off even vaguely close in volume to Apple's tablets. Well, I got to tell you, the Fire Tablet. Probably why. Fire Tablet for a kid, Amazon Fire Tablet, man, that's that's what I recommend. People are always asking me, oh, what's a cheap, how do I get a cheap uh, iPad for my kid? I say, buy an Amazon Fire Tablet because you're like $100. They're terrible. They're terrible things they're terrible prices, <laughs> but they're only going to cost you like a hundred bucks and you can uh, put everything put movies on them and get your kid to leave you alone for a few minutes <laughs> cool cool uh, let me back up one little bit since we do have uh, maybe yeah. a little bit of time this week i was mm-hmm. making a confused face when you were saying that the more recent phones have uh iphones have hardware things that make them uh, more secure. What, right. what would be an example of something that an XR wouldn't have, but I mean, not detailed exactly on that one, but uh, versus a current <sighs> iPhone? They're going to have newer revisions of the various security chips, like the Secure Enclave, because Apple are always learning stuff. So you're not going to see it as a user, but under the hood, they have you know longer key lengths and more hardened chips and things. They're just, whatever the baddies figure out, some of it is baked into hardware and all you can do is the next A series chip you you design it to work around the workaround. I don't think I knew it was baked into the chip. I thought that was, you know, firmware where a firmware upgrade could fix that or, you know, add security or something. I just well, yes and. Y- okay. Yes and. Okay. Sure. It's it's a little bit of it's a little bit of software, a little bit of firmware, a little bit of hardware. All mixed into a big confusing pie. <laughs> and Apple don't give us great detail of any of it because they just tell us the user facing feature. Right. So we discover these things when there's really nerdy vulnerabilities released, and then someone says, Oh hey, we checked Apple's new chip and it's not vulnerable anymore to CVE, bloody bloody, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Okay. Just simply never so, thought of that. All right. Well, and we're done with feedback and follow ups already, huh? We are. So that brings us to our first deep dive, which I'm calling Taking Stock, um, because it's that time of year when my newsfeed inevitably fills up with reports. The year in dot, dot, dot. And I sort of, I put them into my newsreader. I I Basically, I I use an app to collect links for the show, and I I put them in on the expectation that they're a 50-50. If a few of them come together and I can string them into a story, they go into the show notes. And if they're just little atoms, eh, I throw them away. It's like, no, this isn't worth Alison's time. This is worth the listener's time. But two of them came in together that I think tell a story that's important for where we are as we come to the end of 2024, because they tie in with some other bigger trends that we've mentioned in passing, but never dwelt on. So it, like, we usually focus on stuff that you can do to protect yourself as a regular human. But when you think about what actually makes you safe, it's actually two things. There's the things you choose to do and fail to do. That's just as important. And there's the things the companies you trust choose to do and fail to do. 
Okay. And you don't really directly control that second one, right? But that second one impacts you a lot. Do you mean? And, and that's what these reports relate to. Uh, let me let me question the way you're saying this. The actions we choose to yeah. take and fail to take. Don't you mean or? Well, no, and we we choose to do some things and we fail to keep, you know, we choose to use one power steward and we fail to do it reliably. We choose. Okay. Okay. There's okay, things we. Saying. Yeah. You know, there's things we don't do that we should and there's things we do or don't do. You know, we, we make decisions and we just don't do things. Right, they, right. they are equal actions. So the, the reports I'm going to talk about in a sec relate to that second category. But the reason I think it's worth us thinking about is because it affects all of us a lot. And it's now pretty evident now that we are, what, 50 years into the computer revolution, that just leaving it to the free market isn't really working in terms of not having low-hanging fruit just out there. Why are there a million data breaches every year? It's not because the attackers have these amazing zero days that's never been heard of. It's because bugs that were fixed a decade ago are still on production systems. It's like low-hanging fruit doesn't even begin to cover. They're apples and they've fallen on the ground. <laughs> Pretty windfall. Ready to be hoovered up, as you would say. Exactly. So an interesting thing that's also happening this year is that on both sides of the Atlantic, there are moves afoot to put security baselines, to basically to make it companies' responsibility to meet a baseline, which will just hoover up all that low-hanging fruit, because now that's the new bottom. And if that bottom is universally applied, then it doesn't affect competition or anything because everyone has to meet this new baseline. And so you just, well, you've got to do it, right? And this isn't a new idea, right? Healthcare have had baselines for ages now, like HIPAA. There is one whose acronym escapes me this second for financial people. They all have to abide by certain standards, if you are a government agency, your country will have rules you have to follow. Something like so NIST? So this notion of... In like lit NIST guidelines? Precisely, yeah, because... Okay. Yeah, NIST is advisory to not government departments. It's binding on government departments. You know, so that kind of thing. So, you know, we have this idea. And there are moves afoot on both sides of the Atlantic to, to broaden the base, to, to make more people fall into that category of you must... And the details are different everywhere, and I'm not going to bore everyone with the details, but this is a really obvious trend. And another thing that's, that may, might actually happen on this side of the Atlantic, which is very interesting, have you ever noticed that every software license says, and you indemnify us from all damages, intentional or deliberate, in our software? It's, it's not just... All of them have It's it. not just software. I actually read the things, like I remember going horseback riding once when they made me sign a document that said, even if we, uh, due to our negligence, you get injured, uh, you can't sue us. And I'm like, really? You think this is binding in court, do you? Uh, it's a bless your heart. I was going to say, the word there is enforceable, and I don't think the negligence clause is enforceable. <laughs> I don't think so. Well, in Europe, they are actually drafting regulations to make all of those kind of things in software unenforceable. So if a software company is negligent, you can sue them for damages. So imagine CrowdStrike and stuff like that, right? If they were found to be negligent. Why would they have to now, write it is a law negligence. to do that? That just seems obvious. Well, it's, no one has succeeded in challenging that because at, at the moment, software is kind of in this strange area. We don't own the product. So it's actually, no one really succeeds very much in suing over that kind of stuff. So by huh. making it a law that says, no, 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 you're not exempt, that makes it all way easier to get stuff through court, right? If, you know, you make these things explicit. And so if that comes in, that puts a baseline under every company that sells software in Europe not to be negligent. And the definition of negligent would probably end up being a best practice from NIST or something, right? That's going to be agreed by a regulator that best practices you must at least do blah. Yeah, do you really think that will change whether people are ne companies are negligent? I mean, I don't think anybody's negligent on purpose, are they? Well, yeah, but negligence is also failure to act, Yes. Right? Not putting priorities in place is negligence. Yes, yeah. And there's a lot of that. Sure. A lot of that. Because people say, well... Yeah, but people buy our software whether we spend money on these expensive pen tests or not. So why bother? Okay. Yeah. People buy our software if we add security as an afterthought. Why bother? Right, right. Yeah. I think a few court cases and it will, you know, one or two companies go bust and all of a sudden it's like, oh, 
Oh, <laughs> this is real. So I think it's pretty good. Anyway, the thing here is that lots more people are coming under the net. So it may be, if this law goes in, lots and lots and lots of people will come into the net. But even if the only thing that happens is the stuff that's already in train just keeps going, then on both sides of the pond, the kind of people who in 2025 are going to be either about to be or actually regulated include government contractors, critical infrastructure providers are being targeted both sides of the pond. Here in Europe, even educational institutions count as critical infrastructure. So large Irish universities, now we're not getting regulated as much as the power company, mm -hmm. but we're on the spectrum because it's a spectrum of, of different responsibilities for different organizations. And large universities meet the bottom end of the spectrum. You can't just do whatever you want. You do actually have to do the basics. Does a critical infrastructure company include more? the telcos with their back doors? Yes. <laughs> Yes, it does. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it also includes oil pipelines, power companies, medical, I'm sure. that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, medical is already regulated, right? And financial. So they're already, they're already on the net. But that's not stopping and them from then, getting hacked. No, but it means the bait. Right, if you pick all the low hanging fruit, that doesn't mean there's no fruit. It means at least you've picked all the low hanging fruit. Right? These baselines aren't a utopia, but they certainly help a lot. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's good. We're making things better, not perfect, right? And the other one I really like is uh, one of the European regulations that is on the way in is organizations that hold a lot of personal data. Mm. That's Facebook? a pretty good thing to make you count as critical. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Those big companies. Google. They'll have to meet baselines. Microsoft. Yeah. <laughs> Apple. So when you think about why has everyone agreed on both sides of the pond that this is something we need to do. Why do? Why is there this actual momentum actually happening towards this baseline idea? The answer is wonderfully explained when we look at these two reports that made the news in the last two weeks. Okay. So the first report is from the Five Eyes um, countries, their cybersecurity agencies. So the Five Eyes is Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, and the United States. And their intelligence agencies work together as the Five Eyes. And together, they have released a report on the most exploited vulnerabilities of 2023. So they looked at the calendar year 2023 for, they, they focused on large enterprises and which actual software vulnerabilities caused the most damage. Okay. All right. So starting where the return and so the on report itself could, could be made the best. Okay. Yeah. So the report itself has a short um, management summary, which is good. Um, and they have two calls to action, basically. Software vendors need to start doing secure by design. And CISA have been releasing documents to say, when we say secure by design, we mean X. And on different topics. So how you secure by design databases, how you secure by design web apps. What is CISA? The Cybersecurity and Information Security Service, you're, you're a big agency? cybersecurity agency. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, yeah. The, yeah. We, so they come up a lot. They're basically the big cybersecurity people in the US government. So they have guidelines on what secure by design means? To help people implement secure by design, yeah. Okay. So like NIST have guidelines for how to do various things. They basically have on a whole bunch of topic areas, and they've been releasing lots of them this year, and there's more of them on the way, apparently. Um, so if you design software for power grids, secure by design means blah, blah, blah. If you design databases, it means blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's really good, actually. Practical stuff. So that's the first call to action. The people who make the software do better. And everyone else, they're saying, for goodness sake, patch management really matters. Put patch management systems in place, formally track and monitor this, and don't be so slow. <laughs> It's not okay to have stuff managed as, oh, we'll patch that in three months. Quarterly patches is a thing still. Mm. Like in the 80s before the internet, that was okay. 2024, uh-uh. Yeah. But, you know, people aren't quite getting the message. So that's the call to action. So I read through the, the you know, what is the top, what were the top vulnerabilities? And I kind of expected what I'd find. I expected to find that all the stuff that we knew about and that had patches within a few days and that, you know, all the big stuff would just, 
everyone would be too slow to patch. And so even though they shouldn't have been the biggest ones of 2023, they would be. So what caught my eye is that too many organizations are really slow to patch even the stuff that makes the mainstream media. Like, forget about the -the run-of-the-mill stuff that goes under the public radar. Log4j was one of the top vulnerabilities in 2023. That's years old. Is it years old? When when did it come out? Oh, it must be at least 2021, 2022. Certainly not in 2023. Okay. But if I know so about it's it... it's not a zero day anymore in 2023, yeah. Uh, like we had a couple of actual zero days with something called Move It, which is used to move data around by an awful lot of people. But there were remediations posted almost straight away, like, you know, how to check if you've been compromised, how to apply the patch, because, like, it was a zero day, so some people were hacked before there was a patch. 2021. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Huh. Right. That's still on the list. Top 15, and Log4j is still on the list. Wow. Ridiculous. It, is it Now, Move It made all of the mainstream. Nope. Ugh. It's just a matter of having him. The chances are it's just hiding in places because there aren't proper systems giving actual visibility. You, you get killed by the things you don't know you don't know. Right? Right. Those right. unknown unknowns are real killers. Or maybe you even know you don't know what's out there. That's still bad. <laughs> you don't know what's <laughs> you in don't your know. state. Just because you know you don't know doesn't mean you know. <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly. And Move It made all of the headlines that were all like the every emergency response team around the world, like US CERT and all of the big certs, Irish National CERT, they all had remediation out within hours. If you use Move It, you must immediately do this, this, and this. Like it was you couldn't but if you work in cybersecurity, the move it stuff was in your face within hours of it happening. I don't and that, that still one. made the top 15. It was kind of under the hood because it's software that companies use to move data between each other. Oh, okay. okay. So it, the British Airways and a whole bunch of really big companies, you would know it not by the name of the software company, but by the name of the victims, <laughs> which were big things like British Airways and stuff like that. It was okay. a really big deal. And then the other thing is that the one place you should be patching most urgently is the really, really critical stuff like firewalls, remote access tools, and VPNs, those kind of things. Um, your core collaboration tools like your Office Suite, whether that be G Suite or whatever, right? Those really core things should be patched the quickest of all because they're, they are it. They are everything. And yet the list is dominated by... Citrix, Cisco, Fortinet, Barracuda, and Microsoft. They make firewalls, VPNs, remote access, collaboration tools. And you're saying they're the slowest to patch? Those companies are? Well, they're not there. Not the company. No. The companies are quick to patch. Their patches seem to be the slowest to get applied because there's a bias in management against if I do something and it breaks, then I broke it. If I do nothing and it breaks, I didn't break it. So, oh, we don't want any downtime on the VPN. Let's only patch that quarterly or whatever. Well, what if, what if we break the firewall? Then we cut ourselves off the internet. It's like, yeah, but what about the risk of not patching? And I don't think that factors in. I wonder whether that battle will ever be won, Bart, because that's that battle was a daily battle in my life when I was working. And, you know, that's that's been a minute since I've Baselines. been working. Baselines, Alison. That's how you win that battle. You don't make it a choice. You remove the choice. Then it's not a difficult business decision. It's a requirement. You must be patched within seven days. Done. That's that's not a practical statement just to say that because it, it does depend on what it is. Okay, maybe seven days is a little optimistic, but I can speak from direct experience. I live under a 30-day rule. Okay, but I'm, but I'm saying depending on what the thing is, some things have to be done, it can be done quickly and some things cannot. I mean, that that's definitely true. I mean, you can't take down an entire healthcare system within seven days necessarily if you don't know what the implications of all the moving parts are, for example. I mean, th- there will always be things that can't be done as quickly as other things. 
Right, but a proper patch management system means that as you're... De- so it, it will take some time, but as you're deploying them, you do them in such a way that everything is active-active pairs, so you can patch one half while the other half keeps your company up. Then you patch the other half while the other half keeps your company up. Like, there are there are solutions for these things that didn't exist five years ago, let alone 10, 15 years ago, because it's, it's a problem. Like, it's one of our biggest problems. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of opportunity here, and it's just not being done. It's just not being done. The other report then is from MITRE. And these are the people who release the, uh, they're a non-profit that seems to be mostly US oriented. I, they don't quite say on their website exactly where they physically are, but there, there's this, they seem to be strongly US based. Nonetheless, they have developed what has become one of the most important tools for cybersecurity, the MITRE attack framework. This is like so you know the way taxonomy puts all of the animals into kingdoms and species and all these kind of things so that everyone can talk about them in the same way? Well, MITRE ATT&CK is a framework for classifying security threats using a unified language everyone agrees on with definition. So all security tools from all vendors have settled on MITRE ATT&CK. So this has revolutionized how we do things in the last decade or so. It's, it's wonderful. And the MITRE people live and breathe vulnerabilities. That's, that's what they do. They're fascinated by vulnerabilities. <laughs> so they have an annual 25 list of most exploited vulnerability types. I, I can't so confirm MITRE is a US bug? company, by the way. Excellent. Thank you. So what are the 25 most exploited types of bug? And bug this again is... Vulnerability, sorry, bug that causes danger is a vulnerability, right? Okay. Yeah, so mistake. Yeah. Okay. So what what really strikes me is how many old friends are on this list? Like stuff from the 70s is still on this list. Hmm. So breaking it down, I'm left with this thing of we actually have modern best practices and modern tooling that addresses so many of these things that are still in the top 25. It's not that they have to be here. We understand them. We have remediations. We have tools to avoid them. We have tools to find them before you publish the software. Like our toolkit is huge, but it doesn't seem to be being deployed. So how often have I said in programming by stealth that you have to validate all data that comes from the user? You have to assume that users are intentionally trying to put naughty stuff into data. (laughs) And yet... Number one in 2024 is cross-site scripting. Failure to check for JavaScript code in HTML that you accept from the user on a web page. Wow. You have a text box on a web page the user can type in. You're not supposed to let them put JavaScript in there. Failure. The number, number one. one. The number one, a close second is cross-site script, cross-site request forgery, where you have a web form that receives information and doesn't check it really came from who it should. So you can add a link in a social media post that actually sends a command to your router. And instead of your router receiving the command, you're going, "Uh, I'm sorry, that's not a response to a question I asked. The router goes, oh, okay, you'd like to turn off all the firewalls. Sure, fine. (laughs) That's cross-site request forgery. That's also really easy. We know how to fix this stuff. Like, we have all of these tools. That's number four. And what's worse is cross-site request forgery is up. Up by five places in the last year. We're getting worse. We're getting worse. SQL injection, SQL injection, literally around since the 70s. Number three. I remember learning about that. That was a long time ago. Bobby Drop Tables has been XKCD how long? <laughs> That's SQL injection. Path traversal is a very similar thing where you take input from a user and use it to run a command and you don't check it includes things like dot, dot, slash. And then instead of showing the user the thing you're supposed to show them, you show them the content of slash etc slash passwd or something because you've allowed them to navigate your whole file system because you're not checking for dot, dot, slash. Trivial stuff. That's at number five. OS command injection, where you take some input from the user and shell out to bash or shell out to to DOS or something and just run what the user gave you without checking it properly. That's uh, number seven. And generic command injection is number 13. Generic input errors are number 12. The other thing that strikes me is we know 
that there is this concept of memory safe programming languages. Languages like C make you manage your own memory and that's so, so easy to get wrong. But we understand the ways people get that wrong. So we have tools for detecting it. And we have new languages where it's impossible. You can't have a buffer overflow in JavaScript or in Rust because memory management is not up to the human typing. That's part of the language. That's done for you because computers can follow rules rigidly and reliably and humans can't. So the fact that we have memory issues still dominating in 2024 means that there are tools and languages both to detect the stuff in code. If you have to write in C, you should be able to detect it. If you don't have to write in C, then you shouldn't be. And you can test this stuff post-fact. You can test this stuff at compile time. We have all of these tools. And yet, out of bounds write, which is otherwise known as buffer overflow, number two. Out of bounds read, or use after free, which is basically data leaks like Heartbleed, number six and eight. Code injection, remote code execution to you and me. That is sitting up there at number 11, up 12 places. Null pointers, which lead to app crash or denial of service. That's at number 21. And trivial stuff like integer overflows, still at number 23, although it has fallen nine places. So maybe we're almost done with that one. Let me, And then let me, we have leaky security. Hang on, let yeah. me ask a question here. Yeah. Is it possible that since we're seeing the oldest stuff, the, the, the old classic hits rising, yeah. is it possible there's, there's a reason behind its placement that other things are disappearing that were more recently discovered? Oh, nice. is there, I mean, there's got to be a reason. What, what did they displace? What used to be there that disappeared? There might be some good news in there. I don't know. That's a fair point. I guess I am somewhat focusing on the obvious. Well, wait a minute. This is low-hanging fruit. And again, Secure by Design would have none of... Like these things I'm mentioning here, Secure by Design would get rid of those because you would be implementing toolkits from day one to stop these bugs being in your code. Because mm -hmm. that's the best solution. Don't try to debug the code afterwards. Don't write the bad code. Right? That's, that's better. <laughs> By the way, you, and you, the other, you brought up the XKCD about uh, uh, little Johnny drop tables, uh, and you said, how long ago was that? <clears throat> I don't know the date, but it was number 327, and we are now on 3,015. Ouch. Uh, and I put it in the uh, wow. palate cleansers just in case anybody wanted to go oh, see goody. it. Oh, goody. Thank you. Thank you. And then the last sort of, well, the second last section I caught my eye is leaky security controls, which means you're just not doing enough pen testing, right? This is why we have pen tests. This is, this is supposed to be part of standard process that you throw, you throw the white hat folks at your stuff before you sell it. And they find the low hanging fruit like improper authentication, improper privilege management, improper authorization. They're all very high up the list. Exposure of sensitive data to unauthorized actors, known to you and me as a, a data leak. Basically, it's supposed to ask you for a password and it forgets. Just shows you the stuff. Oh, was I supposed to check you are who you say you are? Whoopsie daisies. Missing authentication on critical functions. That's the end of the list. I'm glad that's at number 25 at least, but that's still on the list, which means like a router saying, turn off the firewall. Oh, did I forget to check if you're actually logged into this interface? Whoopsie. <laughs> And then the last one literally made my head explode. Now it is down at number 22 and it has fallen four places. Hard coded credentials. Oh, come on. How? Come Thank on. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, See what I mean by low hanging fruit? Yeah, I, I, I know that one. Right. So anyway, I figured I'd end on one that everyone would just bang their head and go, oh, right, yeah. And this is why baselines are a thing. So that, that's what we're driving at here. So my second deep dive isn't really a deep dive. It was just a story that was too big to be a story. Microsoft have had their version of WWDC. They call it Ignite. And it really caught my eye for cybersecurity because I could smell CrowdStrike all over the announcements, or rather the response to the very spectacular CrowdStrike outage over the summer. So the first thing is that uh, they have made a big deal about a, what are they calling it? A security and resilience initiative. And the two big things they've let us know are that one, 
they are officially working with these security vendors to make a new API for Windows to allow those kind of tools not to have to be in the kernel, which means they can't crash the whole system, which means you can't have a CrowdStrike problem. And we said at the time that the Mac and Linux already have APIs for this, so there's no reason Microsoft can't. Well, that's happening. And they are engaging with the community and there is work going on. So that's good. The other one really made me laugh. So when CrowdStrike happened, the big thing was that you had to physically go to the computer because they wouldn't boot, right? Corporate IT couldn't do something remotely because they couldn't boot. They're adding a new feature to Windows 11 that happens very, very, very early in the boot process before drivers and the dangerous stuff loads that will allow the device to be remote fixed. Hmm. So even if something slips through the net, you'll at least be able to get a remote fix pushed out automatically instead of having to rely on someone physically walking over to every device. And that's clearly CrowdStrike response. And they're good responses, so that's nice. But there were three other things that caught my eye. Windows 11 is getting a nice bit of hardening called admin protection. So even if you're an administrator on your local machine, which a lot of home users like to be because then you can install software and stuff, uh, you won't be running as an admin all the time. Like on the Mac, you'll have to do a Windows Hello, which is the equivalent of Face ID or Touch ID, at the point in time you try to do something admin-like, and then you'll briefly have admin powers, and then they'll fall away again straight away. Hmm. So if you get some malware, you're not always carrying around this superpower because you haven't escalated to the superpower. So that should make all of Windows 11 way more secure than Windows 10. So if people are saying, oh, should I update to Windows 11? Yes, <laughs> if you can. <laughs> Another one that I think is going to make a big difference. So you're talking about how it's difficult to patch stuff quickly because you can't have downtime. What if you could patch the kernel without rebooting? That's coming. Hot patch. Hmm. It's already there in Linux, not yet there on the Mac. And it is now in the insider build of Windows 11. So instead of people putting off, you know, you know, you get that pop-up or lots of people, you wouldn't because you don't use Windows anymore, but lots of people get that pop-up if they work in a corporate environment saying, you must reboot your computer within the next three days. Reboot now or do it later. And they go later, later, mm -hmm. later, later. As long as their, their group policy lets them away with and eventually the computer goes, sorry, not your choice anymore. Goodbye. And usually they're standing in front of a lecture and giving a lecture to 500 students and they're very cranky. And then you go, actually, maybe you should have listened to it three days ago. Sorry, I may be sharing some stuff it does. It does remind me of a wedding I was at with a, a friend of mine who I think I knew better. And uh, he wanted to do a, play a slideshow for at his daughter's wedding. And he was forced to do a Windows reboot and, and a patch update in the oh, middle of the oh, uh, oh, reception. Oh. I might have mocked him a little bit. Oh. Maybe you should in the first, yeah. And then the last one is another nice one. Uh, Windows APIs to allow pass keys managed by third-party apps to work with Windows Hello. In other words, and they have said explicitly they are working with 1Password. So people like 1Password allow you to have your pass key synchronized across multiple devices and to use that pass key for Windows Hello, which again is going to make it way easier to have people's Windows 11 machines more secure. Keep in mind also that uh, you can now install Windows 11 on ARM uh, from an ISO from yeah. on uh, a Mac, on the Sil Apple Silicon Mac. So that's pretty fun. Ooh, that is pretty fun. Yeah, yeah the ARM version is actually pretty good this time. The, this is not Microsoft's first attempt at playing in the ARM playground, but it does actually appear they're doing it properly this time. I hope so. so that's that's nice. Yeah. And okay, back to our usual fodder. Uh, it's been Patch Tuesday. Patchy, patchy, patch, patch. Four zero days. So yeah, definitely patch. Apple also patched Wait, four two zero, zero days. days. For whom? Uh, Microsoft, sorry. Microsoft Patch Tuesday. Okay. So all of your Microsoft stuff, just patch it. Right at this stage, it's been the second Tuesday of the month. You haven't patched. Naughty you. There's something for you. It's probably important. <laughs> Uh, Apple don't have a schedule, but uh, they did release a whole bunch of updates, including two zero days. The actual dodgy code is in every version of their operating system, so they've actually patched everything. But the reason there's extra focus on Intel-based Macs is because those were actively exploited in the wild. So they were the zero part of the zero day. The others weren't actively exploited. We can't tell why. There may be a technical reason. 
But either way, Apple patched it everywhere, but the real problem was on the Mac, and it, on the Intel. And it was only Mac. in uh, the latest versions of the OS. So if you were on Sonoma, for example, it, it, you're unaffected? Yes. So basically it's the iOS, iPad OS 18 dot blah, blah, blah range, and the Mac OS 15 dot blah, 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 and also Vision OS two i think the latest vision os release that came out in september and almost no one noticed <laughs> uh, that one too okay um ubuntu desktop users need to pay attention you don't often have to pay attention but hello three of you um patchy patchy patch patch fairly nasty bug that basically gives any malware that gets onto your machine instant root and that's just not good for in a desktop environment that's you know, there are Ubuntu servers, they could be affected too, but that's it's usually harder to get local execution to be able to elevate, whereas on a desktop, that's way more likely. So definitely one for desktop users to patchy, patchy, patch, patch. You, know, you weren't mocking and Linux then, users the same way you were mocking uh, people who've bought Vision Pro, right? When you said the few of you? No, it's, I, I'm almost sad by the reality that there are not very many desktop Linux users, but every year it is always said, oh, this will be the year of desktop Linux. And Hey, might be right someday, but I've been around for a while and desktop Linux is like hen's teeth. Mm. I know two desktop Linux users. They're very happy, but they're very lonely. Aww. Yeah, I know. Um, I used to know three, but you went back to a Mac. <laughs> um, anyway, um, and I just a timely reminder that one of the things you need to patch very urgently is your security tools. Because... They have a lot of privilege. And this came to my mind. There is a security plugin for WordPress called Really Simple Security, which had a spectacularly major bug that gave attackers admin access to your WordPress without your password. So patchy, patchy, patch, patch. If you install that plugin, you probably installed it for a really good reason. Definitely let that one auto-update. Just, you know, go into your WordPress settings and make sure that one's an auto-update. That would be the one I don't do. think either of us are running it, Alison. No, uh -uh. I'm trying to... I, I'm not a big fan of third-party security tools for WordPress because they have a habit of being leaky. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have one worthy warning. Um, Nocilla Castaways, like you, I, and everyone who does programming by stealth, are big users of GitHub. There is currently available for sale from the baddies a, so a malware as a service offering where you can bulk attack with spear phishing GitHub users. They try to trick you into install this, authorize this GitHub app in order to apply for this job. That kind of stuff is currently what it's being used for. They're going to try to trick you into authorizing, sign in with GitHub on something you shouldn't. And you're going to end up giving permissions on your GitHub account to this app that isn't actually legitimate. And it's going to be phishing. So they're going to target it in some way to try trick you. It's available as malware as a service. So how it will be used is up to the creativity of the baddies. Just be extra suspicious when you get that little pop-up. This GitHub app would like authorization for da-da-da. Just stop and think. Unless you Spite, proactively... Keep your spidey sense up. In, keep your spidey sense up. Exactly, right? If you're installing a new Git client that you chose and you downloaded and you are asked to authorize your client on GitHub, that's fine. Mm -hmm. That's how it's supposed to work. Anything else, Spidey Sense, away. Uh, the only notable news I have left is there's a nice new feature in Signal to make it easier to have repeating calls on their fully secure and encrypted communication network. So if you're looking for sort of the canonical Trust No One encryption app, Signal is a good choice. Why do you call it repeated And it's gotten easier calls. to use. What do you mean repeated? So you, so you know the way we have a link that we click to get into the Zoom call every two weeks. And it's the oh, same okay. link every two weeks. Oh, okay. So you can make this permanent link that says the three of us will get together anytime we want at this link. Got you, got you. Okay. And it'll be end-to-end -end encrypted in the whole kit and caboodle. So that's so how they made it easier you know, to get it's to. Easier. Okay, cool. Yeah which is always good. And then the last thing, I wanted to find some good news to end on. So the United States have tried to tackle the caller spam, you know, all those phone calls to your house with the national do not call list. We have seen since 2021, when the call do not call list came into effect, a 50% drop in unwanted calls in the United States. Hmm. Sure didn't Better. feel like it. <laughs> 
Actually, it's the number of okay. reported calls. Right? Mm. Okay. Fatigue may have something to do with that statistic. You're right. Yeah, I wonder. Yes, that is another explanation. Yeah. Uh, and I have one excellent explainer if you have a propeller beanie that you have spun up and ready to go. How X protects protects you from viruses on Mac OS. I will say the first five or six paragraphs are pretty approachable, pretty much for anyone in our audience, and they're a good overview. And then they dive. Dive, <laughs> dive, dive. It's fascinating. It's really detailed. There's a whole bunch of really cool terminal commands where you can inspect the deep inner workings of XProtect and Apple's various security tools. I was fascinated. I've bookmarked it for reference, but I do say if you read it all, you're a proper nerd and you have earned your certificate. It's, uh, it's pretty it good stuff. Remind people, XProtect is, that's not a third-party thing. No. So your Mac has built-in features to protect you from malware. Apple don't advertise it as being antivirus as such, but it's basically antivirus mm -hmm. and its brand name is XProtect, but it's a big umbrella. It's, there's lots of technical tools that go under the branding umbrella of XProtect. Okay. Um, they Good. probably should rename it Mac OS Protect since they rename it from OS X, but anyway. I was going to say, every time I see it, I think, oh, who's that from? And then uh, as you kept talking, I was going, oh, yeah, yeah, that's built in. So I thought maybe somebody yeah. else was confused. It's built in. Yes. And we have now, th now more palate cleansers since you added one. Um, I am going to go first because I want to follow up from your palate cleanser last time with the amazing image from Euclid. Literally, was it two hours after we recorded? I sent you a message going, oh my God, look what's just dropped into my podcast feed. <laughs> An astronomy cast episode dedicated to the Euclid telescope. Oh. All about the cool instrument that made that cool image. Um, if you're the kind of person who likes to play with stuff then running VMs of Linux or whatever is the kind of thing you might want to do. And you can use free tools, but they tend to be a bit clunky and by geeks for geeks. Whereas the VMware tools are really easy to use and nice GUIs and they work really well. Uh, more of them are now free for everyone. Even people who are just curious, but do technically work within a corporation or stuff, they've just made VMware Workstation and Fusion free for everyone. It's the server products where they're going to make their money not the desktop stuff, which I just think is cool. I think, you know, freemium model, yay. And then if your propeller beanie still has some room, I found an amazing website someone linked to, an A to Z of all the Apple-specific terminal commands on the Mac. So these are terminal commands that only exist on the Mac, and they do Apple-specific stuff. And there's loads of them. So if you, the chances are, if you want to interact with how it does spotlight indexing or something, there's a command for that. If you want to interact with all of the Apple-only features, there's a command for that. Did I send that to you? Because I found that independently and posted it in our Slack. SS64.com. Maybe that's where I saw it. <laughs> yeah, it's really, really fun. Yeah. And then you, you're next because you have two fun ones. All right. So uh, I added exploits of a mom, which is the uh, drop tables uh, joke on XKCD. But when I was searching for that, I, uh, I actually came across a site I'd never seen before. It's called it's Explain XKCD Wiki. So people explain the Ooh. joke. And I love that because like I was looking oh. at the latest one, number 3,500 and some, or something or other. I was like, I have no idea what that joke means and I want to get the joke. And it's technical explanations of what his joke means and why it's funny. And I tried to put a link to the one about drop tables, but because it's a joke about drop tables, there's a whole bunch of funky characters in there, and I got tired of trying to escape all of the um, all of the characters that they put in it. And I just said, okay, just look for ex this explain uh, XKCD wiki. It's very very funny. Um, the other one I had in there was O2 unveiled something called Daisy, and it's an AI granny who is out there now answering phone calls from spammers. So the, the, what they've done is they've seeded where spammers get their phone number banks. They've seeded it with these phone numbers for this AI granny to answer the phone. The whole job of this granny is to keep the spammers on the phone. 
And the video about it, it's yeah. very funny. Obviously, the, the calls aren't video, but it's really well done because it's this very classically uh, AI-looking granny, and, and she's there, you've got the gray hair and the whole thing. And she's just talking about her grandkids or going, hang on, let me go get a pencil to write that down, you know, just keeping them on there. It's very funny. It's very effective. And uh, I hope it's doing, uh, it's doing God's work there. That's oh, amazing. It made uh, the BBC World Service have a podcast once a week called The Happy Pod, where it's only good news. There's not allowed to be anything depressing on The Happy Pod. It's fantastic. Oh, I like it. And they had a feature on Daisy. They let the journalist use Daisy oh. to be on the other end of the conversation. And it was, I, we got to hear Daisy in action. And it's like, oh, so what? where did you grow up? What was your street name when you grew up? She went, oh, I grew up in Luton. And oh, it was a wonderful place. We had an amazing greengrocer down the corner. Where did you grow up? <laughs> did you have a really nice cake shop? And away <laughs> she went. Oh, you need to find the link to that if you or if you can. That that sounds fantastic. It doesn't keep. It's it's one of those mm. podcasts where there's only ever one episode in the feed. What? The current one. Oh, that's mean. Yeah. There's only ever one episode. I know, but it's daily. Sorry, it's twice daily. So that would be a very big feed. Uh, anyway, on. yeah. Tom, Tom Merritt's got a big feed five days a week. <laughs> that's a fair point. That's a fair point. For, I'll see if it's possible to get on the BBC website, maybe. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, might yeah be. maybe if, not. Oh, if I can, I will. That's fabulous, because I would love to hear her in action where somebody's trying to get her to do anything. That's really, really funny. Well, I, we managed to uh, to make some uh, good meaty topics, or you did manage to make some good meaty topics here and out of uh, not a lot of content. This is fun. Oh, good. Well, you know, as I say, I always aim to help. And I had way too much fun writing those deep dives because I was technically finished the show notes before lunch and I didn't actually stop writing until just before five o'clock. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there we are. I like it. Anyway, um, I just might be able to get you a link. Either way, it will be in the show notes if I can. All right. Very good. Oh, I remember what I'm supposed to do now. Remember, folks, if you want to stay secure... Wait, no, I've got it all wrong now because I've tried to I've tried to improvise this while multitasking. Alison multitasks all the time. She finds links, she corrects me. I just tried to find a link and now I don't remember my own outro. <laughs> stay patched till you stay secure or something. Well, that's going to wind us up for this week. Did you know you can email me at alison at podfeet.com anytime you like? If you have a question or suggestion, just send it on over. Remember, everything good starts with podfeet.com. You can follow me on Mastodon at podfeet.com slash Mastodon. And if you want to listen to the podcast on YouTube, just go to podfeet.com slash YouTube. If you want to join the conversation, you can join our Slack community at podfeet.com slash Slack, where you can talk to me and all of the other lovely Nocilla castaways in there. It's great fun. You can support the show at podfeet.com slash Patreon or with a one-time donation at podfeet.com slash PayPal or podfeet.com slash donate where you can use PayPal or a credit card of your choice. And if you want to join in the fun of the live show, head on over to podfeet.com slash live on Sunday nights at 5 p.m. Pacific time and join the friendly and enthusiastic Nocilla Castaways. Thanks for listening and stay subscribed.